Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey, and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. Twice per month, we discuss pediatric health topics with top experts from Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. If you're joining us for the first time, we want to hear your questions. So please post your questions below about today's topic, which is surgery for inflammatory bowel disease in children. Joining me today is Dr. Dean Potter. He is a pediatric surgeon at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Dr. Potter is also an associate professor of surgery and the chair of the Division of Pediatric Surgery at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. He's an expert in many different areas of pediatric surgery, but he also has special interest in surgical interventions for children with inflammatory bowel disease. And we will get to some of those specific surgeries later in the broadcast, so stay with us. And don't forget to send your questions in. Dr. Potter, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Yes, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So let's start by talking about what exactly inflammatory bowel disease is before we can kind of get into the more nitty gritty about surgeries. Sure. So inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic inflammatory condition of the GI tract. And in general, we think of it as two separate conditions, mm -hmm. uh, although it kind of all blends together in certain cases. So mm -hmm. we have ulcerative colitis on one side, which affects essentially only the colon, the rectum and the colon, mm -hmm. or Crohn's disease, which in, in, affects essentially any part of the GI tract. Mm -hmm. And because of those differences, they are treated somewhat differently mm -hmm. surgically. Medically, uh, they're very similar, though. Okay. So um, as a surgeon, you're not the person managing inflammatory bowel disease. Um, when does a surgeon become involved in the care, and, and who else is involved in that team of helping care for this child? Sure. Ideally, it's a multidisciplinary uh, treatment team, mm -hmm. uh, particularly here in Rochester. Um, we have a pediatric gastroenterologist, mm -hmm. we have pediatricians, and we also have mm -hmm. pediatric surgeons involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a patient is seen and diagnosed long before they ever see a pediatric surgeon. Right. And it's very important to have an experienced pediatric gastroenterologist. Um, but unfortunately, a certain number of patients, you know, are refractory to that uh, treatment plan mm -hmm. despite very strong medications. And that's when pediatric surgeons or inflammatory bowel disease surgeons become involved, like myself and mm -hmm. some of the other pediatric surgeons here. Okay. What percentage of children will actually need to resort to surgery to help control their inflammation in, the, in their bowel? Yeah. Well, once they see me, it's pretty high, yeah. but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, it's a moving number, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, there were some studies done, um, and those numbers are, are much higher than what they use, are, they're much lower than what they used to be. Mm -hmm. So the medications are improving, mm -hmm. our treatment programs are improving. Mm -hmm. So the actual number of kids that require surgery is decreasing. Okay. Um, so, you know, the old fashioned numbers would be a patient with Crohn's disease, about 80% of those people will require surgery at some point in time mm -hmm. in their life. Now, that may be uh, an abscess drainage or a major bowel resection, right. whereas maybe a, a person with ulcerative colitis, it's 10 to 20% in their okay. lifetime. Okay. We think those numbers are lower now because of the, the treatments that we have. Okay. But, you know, it's still a significant number uh, okay. of people. And, and uh, again, it's a, it's a collaborative thing that is decided upon with your... Right. Peds GI doctor, uh, the family, and a surgeon when, when it's time for surgery. So if you have Crohn's disease, if I'm understanding this right, you're more likely to have some type of surgical intervention. Not necessarily a major major procedure, but at least meeting your pediatric surgeon um, during your childhood for inflammatory bowel disease. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I mean, okay. and again, like you said, it may just be a, an, an abscess that needs to be drained, yeah. uh, not necessarily a major operation, okay. but certainly the risk is higher for Crohn's disease okay. and ulcerative colitis. So... Once you've determined that some type of surgical intervention is needed, um, is there some type of planning that you do or imaging to kind of help you figure out what is the next or what is the best option? Because there's a lot of different procedures that you can do. Yes, there are yeah. a lot of yeah. options. Yeah. And over the years, we've learned what options are the best. Okay. And, you know, thankfully, we have a long history in surgery of learning from, mm -hmm. you know, prior mistakes and prior treatment plans. Um, so identifying whether a patient really fits into the category of ulcerative colitis versus the category of Crohn's disease is vitally important for a surgeon to okay. know. And sometimes we're in these gray zones where you have indeterminate mm -hmm. colitis. So maybe it has features of mm -hmm. ulcerative colitis. Maybe there's a few features of Crohn's disease. That makes it harder for us to yeah. really make a, a long-term plan okay. surgically, even though some of those patients require surgery. So imaging, uh, colonoscopies with biopsies, uh, blood tests, 
all these things are vitally important for us to really try to categorize a patient into ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Because once you have Crohn's disease, um, we've learned over the years that like an ileal pouch anal anastomosis mm-hmm. is not an option really okay. for you. Uh, you would be looking at more um, resection anastomosis sort of situation mm-hmm. versus a total removal and reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Can you explain a little bit more why that wouldn't be an option for them? Um, well, you know, we've, we looked at our data here in mm-hmm. Rochester. Uh, we did our first um, ileal pouch anal anastomosis in 1980. So okay. we've been doing it for a long time yeah. in kids. And uh, we know that the long-term success of an ileal pouch anal anastomosis is uh, well above 90% mm-hmm. uh, at our institution. Wow. It goes way down when you start okay. adding in the patients with Crohn's disease. Okay. So for a while, we did mm-hmm. do pouches for kids with Crohn's disease mm-hmm. because we thought it was the mm-hmm. best operation. Right. But about 70-ish percent of those mm-hmm. patients will have their pouch in 10 years okay. versus 95% okay. in an ulcerative colitis okay. patient. So as soon as you're diagnosed with Crohn's disease, uh, usually the ileal pouch is not a great option for okay. that patient group. Is, um, is surgery going to be, I don't want to use the cure, word curative, but for people with ulcerative colitis, um, are they much more likely to have kind of long, better long-term remission after some of the surgical procedures? Absolutely. Okay. So when you think about surgical cures, mm-hmm. you know, we say we can cure ulcerative colitis because that's a disease of the rectum and the colon. And right. we can take out essentially the entire colon and you know mm-hmm. the vast majority of the rectum and reconstruct that with an ileal pouch mm-hmm. of some fashion. Whereas for Crohn's disease, we can't cure that surgically. Mm-hmm. So we take care of the problem areas mm-hmm. uh, and then get the patients back onto their medications uh, and moving forward. Because again, uh, Crohn's disease tends to come back uh, after surgery. Right, right. We have a question from the audience here, and, and the question is, when do we talk um, to their, your child's uh, physician about surgery? When does that decision be brought up? Is it something the parents should be bringing up? I think it's always great to be involved mm-hmm. as a parent and to be concerned. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the vast, you know, a certain number of patients, uh, their symptoms are controlled with diet alone or mm-hmm. simple medications. So does that patient group need to talk to a surgeon? Most likely not. It's right. scary. It's a very stressful situation yes. for everybody yeah. involved. So there are a number of patients that don't need to talk to okay. a surgeon. But I think once your child starts to fail therapies, if mm-hmm. you're failing the anti-TNFs, mm-hmm. if they're not getting off their steroids, if now they're adding methotrexate or 6-MP to another mm-hmm. medication, you know, you're starting to progress along the treatment path. And, you know, getting some information about surgery is a good idea right. uh, so everyone can become informed because mm-hmm. it's not a decision that's made in one day. It's a decision that's made over weeks. Mm-hmm. And it really has to be taken into context with mm-hmm. each individual patient and how it fits into their life and their treatment plan. And you guys are doing some type of conference uh, planning together with the inflammatory bowel disease specialist, the pediatric GI doctors and sure. stuff? Okay. Here, here in Rochester, mm-hmm. we meet all together. Wow. So, okay. you know, whether it's Dr. Tom. Dr. Stevens, Dr. F- uh, Fabian, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Apps, uh, all the PEDS GI people, mm-hmm. if they ask me to see a patient, the vast majority of the time I walk into the room with them. Okay. We all sit down together as a family and we talk about the pros and cons of, of all the treatment options, okay. uh, including surgery or including you know maybe an experimental uh, protocol as well. Definitely. Well, we're going to get to some of those advantages and disadvantages mm. later. Let's. Um, why don't we talk about some of the specific surgeries? And I think we have some diagrams that we can look at um, for use with that. Um, so there's, you know, colectomies. There's ileostomies. There's the IPA that mm-hmm. you refer- referenced. Can you break down some of these surgeries for us and when you would use them? Sure. So um, for uh, colectomy. Um, for ulcerative colitis, let's start that way. Okay. So for ulcerative colitis, the ultimate uh, procedure in our in our hands would mm-hmm. be a total proctocolectomy where you remove the entire colon, mm-hmm. the entire rectum, and then a reconstructive uh, procedure so you can stool normally through okay. your anus. And mm-hmm. that is the ileal pouch anal anastomosis. Okay. And uh, uh, if we could pull up that picture of the ileal pouch. So there you see, uh, this is a female patient, um, and the rectum has been removed, and the pouch has been sewn down to the anal canal uh, on the, uh, underneath the ileal pouch anal anastomosis uh, diagram there. And it really, the ileal pouch is just the ileum that's been folded over on itself and constructed to make a much larger reservoir to hold stool. Okay. 
you know, how we get to this spot can be uh, a long process on occasion. So if someone's very mm -hmm. sick, you know, they've been on a lot of medication, they're nutritionally not well, they've lost a lot of weight, uh, maybe they've had many infections from all the medications they've been on. So then we tend to start with a, a colectomy or a removal of the colon and they have an ileostomy. Okay. And we can also show a picture of the end, uh, the end ileostomy, mm -hmm. um, what that looks like. Okay. And, that gives them a chance to get off all their medications. They mm -hmm. tend to be able to eat and mm -hmm. regain their regain their nutritional levels. Mm -hmm. And once they've recovered, mm -hmm. maybe six months or so after that, then we move on to the ileal pouch surgery. Okay. And with the ileal pouch, will will the ileostomy be then taken down, or will that will remain? In generally, in general, the ileostomy is taken down about two months after the pouch okay. is formed. Uh, occasionally, particularly in patients with uh, FAP or polyposis syndromes mm -hmm. where we're doing the surgery for cancer, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't use ileostomies, but that's uh, somewhat of a special situation. Okay. Um, what about, um, there's been some like, advances in how you guys are performing these surgeries. Mm -hmm. Why don't you share some of um, kind of the new minimally invasive uh, approaches? I shouldn't say new because you've yeah. been using them for a while now. They have been yeah. used for yeah. a while and we continue to improve on them uh, because of new technologies and new mm -hmm. techniques. So, uh, you know, some years ago, probably 10, 15 years ago, all mm -hmm. these were done open. So a long abdominal incision, uh, mm -hmm. it tends to cause a large inflammatory reaction. Mm -hmm. So um, like the picture open rarely used there, mm -hmm. um, those patients tend to be in the hospital for a very long time, you know, a week to 10 days. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas, you know, years ago, uh, people started to develop the laparoscopic procedure. So it was now small incisions, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a centimeter or two in size. Uh, and recovery was much more uh, rapid that way. Mm -hmm. their, their bowel function would return faster. Uh, their uh, stomas would start to work faster. Uh, and um, people uh, got out of the hospital much more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the complications were much less. Okay. And, you know, recently we've taken that even further. And now instead of having uh, multiple small incisions, we use one incision. Uh, in this particular uh, photo, uh, the incisions through the umbilicus, so it'll probably be invisible uh, mm -hmm. once that heals. More commonly, we do the next uh, incision, if we can move to the next picture. But, uh, that So we tend to put the incision where the ileostomy would go. Okay. So you would only have really an incision for your ileostomy. And what we found is that uh, with just this single incision surgery, uh, the recovery is even faster. So, uh -huh. you know, patients tend to stay about three days in the hospital after something like this, depending on how sick they were before the surgery. Okay. Um, have you noticed any changes in um, the outcomes for complications or um, some of the more concerning um, things that can happen a sure. as a result of surgery when somebody has a, a really inflamed gut. Sure. Yeah. So I think that's the key, mm -hmm. you know, how sick is a patient going into the surgery? Mm -hmm. And that's really uh, kind of what we found is the most important thing. So okay. if someone's very ill, mm -hmm. you know, they've been on TPN for or, uh, uh, IV nutrition for a long mm -hmm. time, they haven't been able to eat, they tend to be uh, in the hospital longer. Mm -hmm. um, whereas patients that are, are just failing their medical management and they need to have uh, the next step done, mm -hmm. they tend to do a little better. Okay. So certainly we've seen fewer complications mm -hmm. with the laparoscopic um, procedures than the mm -hmm. open procedures such as wound infections, bowel obstructions. Okay. Um, we also think that for young girls, still mm -hmm. their pregnancy rate is probably better with okay. laparoscopic procedure because there's less scarring in the right. pelvis. Right. Um, you know, we don't have long-term data on that, but mm -hmm. we think it's better. Okay. Um, what about what can I, what, what do you tell a family when they're coming in? What, what can they expect to um, happen in, in the recovery time, pain wise? How sure. long are they going to be in the hospital? When they, can they get back to being a normal kid? Yeah, eating and then doing all those things. Sure. Yeah. Well, if it's a straightforward operation, we mm -hmm. usually let them start drinking liquids the same day. Wow. Uh, maybe move to solid foods the next day if okay. their their GI tract has recovered from wow. surgery. Um, we've had people leave the hospital after a major colon operation in two days. Um, so it's a little bit, again, dependent on how ill the patient is mm -hmm. coming in. So mm -hmm. if they've been more ill, mm -hmm. uh, they tend to stay in the hospital three to five days. If mm -hmm. they've been relatively healthy, it's closer to three days. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to get them on a regular diet pretty quickly because okay. that helps the bowel heal and, mm -hmm. and the patient heal as well. So pain-wise, a lot of patients are on Tylenol only uh, when they go home, but some require mild narcotics. 
Okay. So, and as far as restrictions, everybody does it a slightly different, okay. you know. So, we usually say no vigorous exercising for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. after this. Okay. Um, so, you know, within a month, you should be back to normal, uh, feeling usually better. Okay, that's great news. Um, have you guys uh, at Mayo Clinic Children's Center, uh, and I should say not guys, but physicians, mm -hmm. yes. um, have you studied the outcomes? Because I imagine that some centers have much more experience. Some centers maybe don't have as much experience, and you probably probably matters on what the outcomes are if you're Absolutely. not doing as much of them. Absolutely. So we've looked closely at our outcomes and and we reviewed all our patients going back to 1980 um, and we sent out uh, questionnaires to those patients. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, almost 16, the median follow-up is 16 years. We have some oh. patients, their follow-up is more than 30 years. Okay. And what we found, at least for the iliopouch anal anastomosis, mm -hmm. that their uh, function mm -hmm. uh, is the same after about 25 years as it is, you know, the first year of their surgery. So mm -hmm. it's really a durable procedure if you pick the patients correctly mm -hmm. and, you know, weed out the patients that have Crohn's disease mm -hmm. and do it for ulcerative colitis, the mm -hmm. results are quite good. And their satisfaction yeah. is also high when you look at different activities like sporting activities, leisure activities, okay. traveling. Okay. These are different uh, quality of life measures we've, right. we've measured and it's better. Okay, great. What about, um, how likely is it like after the IPA surgery for them to have uh, fecal continence or rectal continence? Yeah. It should be 100%. Really? Absolutely. Wow. Okay. So um, we haven't had an incontinent patient for a very, very long time. Wow. Now, um, some patients will leak a little bit of stool, mm -hmm. um, and that's usually when they're sick. Okay. Uh, you know, because you don't have a colon, mm -hmm. if you get a viral illness, uh, you tend to leak a little bit of okay. stool. But the vast majority of our patients, when you talk to them, they're mm -hmm. not using anything for continence. They don't leak stool. Uh, they can hold their stool and get to the bathroom. Uh, so it should really not be an issue. Okay. After you're doing surgeries where you're taking out a large portion of either the large intestine or the small intestine, do they need to worry about nutritional status or hydration yeah. status after that? Is there any warnings that you give to them? Absolutely. Okay. So patients, particularly with Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. we worry about short bowel syndrome okay. um, in, you know, years past um, we treated Crohn's disease almost like cancer mm -hmm. so if it's diseased we got to take it out hook it back up and then mm -hmm. people were left with very short amount of intestine mm -hmm. so they would be diagnosed with something called short bowel syndrome mm -hmm. but over the years we've learned that you know even though the bowel is diseased we shouldn't take it out we mm -hmm. should only take out the bowel that's giving them a problem that's obstructed that's fistulizing okay. so the risk of short bowel syndrome is much less than what it used to be okay. so but as far as ulcerative colitis, um, the colon really, its major um, job mm -hmm. uh, physiologically is to resorb water, uh, some potassium, some short chain fatty acids. So mm -hmm. in general, uh, patients with ulcerative colitis never miss it and are quite okay. happy to get rid of it sometimes. Okay. Do they have to have any special recommendations for hydration if they're doing like endurance sports or you know things like running marathons things like that to make sure that yeah. they're getting enough hydration or they, they need to take percent. in some extra okay. and we do kind of guide them through their diet mm -hmm. so we give them what's called a constipating diet so there's okay. foods that make you go to the bathroom okay. more and there's foods that make yeah. you go to the bathroom less okay so we really encourage patients to eat a constipating diet if they don't want yeah. to then they go yeah. to the bathroom a little bit yep. more than the sure. person that eat some more restricted diet okay. so so what's a constipated what's in a constipating diet yeah so okay. it's it's foods that thicken the stool okay. so it's uh, i tell patients it's stuff that absorbs water so okay. bread pasta rice uh peanut butter is very good okay. bananas okay. Uh, and you want to avoid things that are that cause diarrhea so spicy mm -hmm. foods very fibery foods mm -hmm. Uncooked fruits and vegetables, really, for a while, we ask our patients not to eat those, mm -hmm. but then slowly reintroduce them into their diet and okay. see, you know, if you eat a lettuce salad, how is that going to mm -hmm. affect your bowel function? And some people, okay. it doesn't affect them at all, and other people, it, it causes them to have several bowel movements. So. so sometimes with inflammatory bowel disease, they'll put them on a low residual diet. Mm -hmm. Is that How does that differ from the constipating diet? Is it similar or is it different? It's similar. Okay. So a low residual diet is really to try to prevent obstructions. Okay. So if you have a narrowing or something, mm -hmm of that nature then that's really what that's for this is to really thicken the stool and slow slow the stool output okay can you explain to us how you guys are able to recreate the rectum on, on your ipa surgeries sure yeah. so there's a couple of different ways of doing that yeah. so um 
you can either staple it using a mechanical stapler mm -hmm. or you can hand sew it. Mm -hmm. And in general, the pediatric surgeons here tend to hand sew that. Okay. So what we do is we remove the mucosa or mm -hmm. the inner lining of the bowel mm -hmm. and then uh, get rid of the entire thickness of the bowel mm -hmm. once it's safe to do that. Okay. Uh, and then we use sutures to sew that mm -hmm. to the bottom. So you're retaining the musculature around it. Okay. Yeah, so the sphincter muscles. Yep and the outer layer of the bowel is present for a period of, of a short distance. Okay. When you staple it, mm -hmm. uh, there's usually a little bit longer rectal cuff, which usually doesn't cause any troubles, mm -hmm. uh, and they use a mechanical device or stapler to staple that. So the outcomes are really kind of debatable, mm -hmm. what's better, you know, mm -hmm. we, we debate back and forth, but mm -hmm. the honest truth is, if you have a good surgeon, mm -hmm. they should do, do it the way they're most comfortable with, and that's how you're gonna get your best outcomes. Okay. Any advice to families when um, choosing where they're going to have uh, their surgery done for their child's inflammatory bowel disease? I think so. I mean, for certain mm -hmm. operations, they should really be at a center that does this frequently. So okay. if your child requires a ileal pouch mm -hmm. or uh, an operation for ulcerative colitis, you should really be at mm -hmm. a center that does it frequently, okay. not just a few times per year, because it's a very complicated operation. Um, mm -hmm. There are many complications mm -hmm. associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the long-term outcome is really uh, predicated on you know management in that perioperative period. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important to be at a center that does it frequently. Um, for more routine operations like um, mm -hmm. abscess drainages or maybe more straightforward Crohn's disease mm -hmm. operations where it's just a small piece of bowel being removed, mm -hmm. then you know maybe a high volume center mm -hmm. isn't as important. Mm -hmm. But certainly for the complex operations, it's very mm -hmm. important. So sometimes people will say kids are just little adults. Um, so I would imagine as a pediatric surgeon, you have a little bit more experience in, in operating on kids because they're not just little adults, right? right? They have a very kind of different anatomy and stuff. So yeah. may, maybe somebody who's an adult surgeon who doesn't see kids as much wouldn't wouldn't necessarily have as much experience doing it sure. as, as a pediatric surgeon. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think the anatomy may mm -hmm. be smaller. Mm -hmm. um, there can be some differences there. But mm -hmm. I think when you're dealing with children, mm -hmm. particularly teenagers, um, it's a mm -hmm. different um, psychological situation. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't treat them like a 20, 30, 40, 50 mm -hmm. year old. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to treat them like a child. They're not mature mm -hmm. mentally yet. Um, mm -hmm. And they're going through a lot of body image changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of resources, not only to deal with the physiology mm -hmm. and the anatomy, but also the mental uh, psychology aspect mm -hmm. of it. So I think that's a huge part when you start to deal with teenagers and adolescents mm -hmm. as well. Do you guys have them meet with a psychologist as they're going through this process? Absolutely. Okay. There's a psychologist in our uh, okay. multidisciplinary inflammatory bowel disease okay. clinic. Wow, mm -hmm. fantastic. And yep. anyone else do that, that they meet with that, through that process to help them with some of the changes, the emotional change, the the stress that they're going through with dealing with this chronic illness. Absolutely. Okay. We have a child psychology group here okay. as well. Uh, Dan Hilliker is someone that we work with very closely okay. and his colleagues. So okay. we frequently have him visit mm -hmm. with our patients and he does an amazing job uh, mm -hmm. with them. I would imagine social work and child life also probably work oh, yeah. pretty closely in these situations. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're so involved. I forget to mention them, know, but yeah. ch child life is hugely important. Yeah. And, you know, if your child has an uh, anostomy and they right. need their bag changed, you know, for an adult, you pull it off and put it back on. Okay. But, you know, that can be very traumatic to a child okay. taking off a bandage or an ostomy mm -hmm. bag. So our child life specialists do a great mm -hmm. job of getting them through that the first few times. Mm -hmm. And they learn that it's not a mm -hmm. huge deal. And, and, you know, pretty soon they take off and they're doing it all by themselves. Awesome. So. so families that don't have access uh, to maybe child life here, they can talk to their um, their provider, their inflammatory bowel disease provider, maybe their pediatrician ask for somebody who works with children, yeah. teaching coping mechanisms, distraction techniques, those kind of things. Absolutely. Great. Yep. Um, children with inflammatory bowel disease are going to be at risk for, for other things, and one of those happens to be blood clots. I, can you talk a little bit more about that and how you guys address this and help yeah. prevent it when they're in the hospital setting? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Recent research has really focused on thromboembolism, or blood clots, okay. in hospitalized people. 
and um, large studies have shown that the high, one of the highest risk in kids mm -hmm. is patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So a child that's admitted to the hospital mm -hmm. with an inflammatory bowel disease flare is at a very high risk or a relatively very high risk mm -hmm. of developing a blood clot uh, in their legs or maybe in their intestine or mm -hmm. you know sometimes even around their brain that's been described. So um, we have protocols here that any patient that's been admitted with a IBD flare mm -hmm. uh, is put on uh, prophylaxis or okay. a treatment to prevent blood clots. Okay. You know, once you undergo a large operation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't want to totally anticoagulate patients, mm -hmm. you know, because you risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are uh, in the process of studying what's mm -hmm. the risk of blood clots after a major abdominal operation mm -hmm. with inflammatory bowel disease. So it's seven centers in ourselves. Okay. We're kind of reviewing what the actual risk is. Mm -hmm. We know from a study here performed a few years ago that about 4% of our patients will develop a blood clot in their intestinal vein, and that requires heparin uh, to treat mm -hmm. or anticoagulant mm -hmm. to treat that. Um, but does everyone require mm -hmm. heparin? And that's really what we're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. Right now we're, we're, we are treating patients because mm -hmm. we think that's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. But just like all these things we talked about mm -hmm. before, we learn things over time and we change our practice to what's best for patients. So you're talking about pharmacological treatments. Are you mm -hmm. doing non-pharmacological treatments too to prevent some yeah. of the blood clots? Okay, what Absolutely. would some of those be? Uh, so we call them SCDs or okay. sequential compression devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so the leg squeezers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So the problem with the leg squeezers, yeah. they need to be used for 16 hours a day. Wow. So, you know, to get a yeah. child to leave leg squeezers on for yeah. 16 hours a day is really difficult. Right. So to be really effective, you know, really pharmacologic or heparin or shots okay. will need to be used. Okay. Sounds good. Are there any other areas of research that, that uh, your your group has been pre looking into in regards to inflammatory bowel disease outcomes and surgeries? Absolutely. So um, all the time new drugs are coming out for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. So you know, not so long ago that was infliximab or Remicade. Mm -hmm. And there was all sorts of worries about what will happen mm -hmm. when we do surgery on patients that have received Remicade. And we okay. found out that there are risks of infections and those okay. sorts of things. But every few years, there's a new biologic drug that mm -hmm. comes out. So Humira or mm -hmm. Adalimumab, uh, Simsia. Now there's um, Vito or Intivio. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a new uh, anti-TNF. Okay. So in adults, they found that there's a high risk of infection with, mm -hmm. with um, Betalizumab or Intivio. Um, Say that 10 times. Yes, I have a hard time <laughs> saying it. <laughs> but uh, um, we've reviewed our... Our, our results in mm -hmm. kids because we tend to see a lot of patients mm -hmm. that are on those third and fourth line treatments mm -hmm. um, and we have submitted that for publication actually just recently and what we found is while it seems like there's a higher risk of infection mm -hmm. there's really not okay. with with patients that are treated with Vito or mm -hmm. Antibio mm -hmm. uh, that undergo surgery. Okay. So we still worry like crazy when, when we have yeah. to do it, but yeah. uh, we are learning uh, okay. that it's maybe not as big a deal as we think. Are you treating them any different, the ones that you're concerned about infection, doing any prophylactic antibiotics or things along those sure. lines? Yeah. Uh, they get the routine antibiotics. Okay. Uh, you know, those patients are the ones that would get the colectomy with endoleostomy because that tends to be a safer operation mm -hmm. than to create a pouch and mm -hmm. pull that down to the to the pelvis, you know, to undergo a two hour operation is much safer than mm -hmm. to go undergo a six hour operation to create a pouch. Wow. So, so six hours for the IPA surgery. Yeah, wow. usually on average. Okay. So it's a very you said it was a very technically difficult surgery. It's, so yeah, it's a lot of steps, a lot of a lot of complicated things you have to go through to get things to reach and to Absolutely. to work well. Absolutely. Um, let's finish up um, by just if there are any resources that you can give parents to give them more information about these specific surgeries. Um, what would you recommend, websites and things along those lines? Yeah, there's a lot of information on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, not all the information is great information, mm -hmm. so certainly um, there are some reputable websites to visit. You know, mayoclinic.org has a lot of uh, good information on uh, the different diseases and the operations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, or CCFA, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, a very reputable group. Uh, mm -hmm. We're members of that, many of us, mm -hmm. and their, their information is also very very good okay. uh, and it's specific to inflammatory bowel disease okay. so which is nice yeah. um, in regarding pediatric surgery mm -hmm. the American Pediatric Surgical Association or APSA APSA okay. they have a nice uh, patient education uh, part of their website mm -hmm. so that would be a, a good uh, resource 
or other, any other major pediatric hospital, I think, would be a decent resource mm -hmm. to go to. Absolutely. So um, don't always believe what you hear maybe on other sites and look for the, these credi credible sources with research backing them. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and don't always believe everything you hear. You know, we, we hear, yeah. we have patients come here all the time that says if my patient, if my son has or daughter has this surgery, they're mm -hmm. going to die. It's like, well, we do that a lot here mm -hmm. and they seem to do okay. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, I think um, experience yeah. is important yeah. and, and always asking questions right. when it doesn't seem to be right. in line with what you're yeah. hearing or potentially seeing. Right. We love questions and we love when parents come with questions and stuff like that because then the understanding is there um, and you can have better dialogue, I think. So, Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing those resources. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Um, that's all the time we have for today. Absolutely. Um, please uh, join us in two weeks for the next Ask the Mayo Mom on August 24th. It's going to be at a new time, 1 p.m. Dr. Eric Botham, who is a pediatric ophthalmologist or a pediatric eye surgeon, will be joining us to discuss eye diseases in children. And this will be during Pediatric Health Eye Health Month. Um, we will be discussing things like lazy eye, also known as strabismus, um, and congenital and pediatric cataracts. So please send your questions to us in advance. And thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful uh, rest of your day.